Hey beer lovers, welcome back to the Craft Beer Channel. Today I'm down at one of the most underrated breweries, I think, in the UK, and that's Affinity. These guys haven't been going too long, but locally they've built up a really low following because of their really fresh, delicious, zingy, often Belgian-inspired uh, beers that have huge amounts of drinkability that are incredibly approachable. Um, and approachable is a theme that carries out throughout the whole of this brewery in the way they present themselves even in the politics that they stamp on their cans uh, and particularly in the way they run their tap room and indeed their cask beer festival which is one of the best in the world it's a super interesting interview with these guys check it out and check out their beers this is affinity brew co So I'm here with the founders of Affinity Brew Co. Guys, introduce yourselves, because as you just said, you don't know what your roles are. <laughs> uh, I'm Ben, I'm the co-founder of Affinity Brewing Company. And I'm Steve, and I'm also co-founder of Affinity Brewing Company. Well, that cleared that up. Great. <laughs> um, tell me about your background, because I think that not many people will know Affinity. You came so close to coming into our beers, uh, breweries to watch out for in 2019, and the reason you didn't make it is because I couldn't find a can in time. <laughs> um, <laughs> that happens. So you might not know who these guys are, but they are brewing some fantastic beer and taking a unique angle. Um, um, how did Affinity get going? So yeah, we um, started in December 2016. Um, we got together with the idea to start Affinity Bruco uh, in June of that year. Decided to start telling people we were going to open a brewery. Um, did you do it too early or did you you come good pretty quick? Uh, well, yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> uh, we, um, it, it, went, it went good really, really uh, quickly because of the collaborative uh, nature of the brewing industry uh, just us telling people we were going to open a brewery people got in touch with us and said you know and spatch and up there selling their old kit so we went and tried to get hold of that got yes. hold of it put into storage uh, and then we saw uh, mark hislop was opening a place five miles up in tottenham so um yeah uh, he said you can put a shipping container in the yard yeah. or in the brewery there so we kind of pieced it together really quickly and it's like the old way that when you bought a house people go like, oh well i've got this old settee mm. exactly. and uh, i've got an old tv i don't use yeah. anymore and you slowly like cobble so. it and that's kind of how we did the tap room here as well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Thank always the german style benches to start yeah. And <laughs> yeah so what was the the concept what did you think was maybe missing from bermondsey or missing from london beer scene that you guys wanted to fill well because we so we started up in Tottenham. Um, Bermondsey was just a, a cash in um, for us. <laughs> um, but no, we, uh, Steve's got a, a deep passion for um, Belgian beers, and he did a lot of saisons at Brew by Numbers, um, his gig before this. Um, and so I think, yeah, that kind of lovely, dry, fresh drinkability. Mm -hmm. um, we were very interested from the start, and like initially, a lot of what we did was Belgian stuff. Um, and then we realised how tough that is to sell. Yep. But we would still have Breeze as a staple beer. It's the one we brew the most. Um, and most of the issue with Belgian beer is, I mean, A, there's sort of a flavour profile people aren't so used to, but B, it's the ABV, yeah. whereas Breeze is... 3.8, three, yeah. 3.8, yeah. Mm. So. so, yeah, um, and particularly in the, in the summer, it outsells everything. It outsells for the many our Session IPA. So, mm. um, yeah, so I'm not sure if we actually looked specifically at um, what we needed to brew in order to fill any gaps, but where our passions kind of align is just sessionable drinkability um and so yeah. yeah having a focus on balance was always really important yeah. so it didn't we weren't limited limiting ourselves to different styles um we could certainly be uh considered as a uh, an adjunct brewery because we use a lot of spices herbs and but we tend to use them in uh quantities that accentuate flavors and yeah. produce ba a balanced create hints all over the place rather than yeah. whoomph that's chocolate yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah yeah um so yeah why, why why is there lots of adjuncts in your brewing was that because i mean brew by numbers did a little bit on mm. it but i guess you weren't going overboard there either it wasn't necessarily deliberate uh i think um when we started we uh when we moved to bermondsey we decided to uh do a calendar project to keep things fresh so we were constantly coming up with new ideas um, and when we were doing that, we were thinking about the flavours that we liked at certain times of the year, or so things, things that you would associate with that particular month. Um, so it just meant that we were experimenting a bit more with things like rose petals and um, champagne yeast and mm. uh, yeah, coffee and walnut. Um, so and taking a seasonal approach meant that the adjuncts came in because hops now are kind of year round because yeah. they're harvested mm. once a year in the north and once a year in the south, and you just. Yeah, exactly. And it, it just keeps things it keeps things fresh for us. I think it keeps things fresh for the customer as well. So on a Saturday when they come to Bermondsey and there are, you know, the likes of Colonel, um, Partisan and Brew by Numbers have gotten them for 
uh, their IPAs, session IPAs, pale ales, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, uh, there are still saisons and things coming from Partizan and uh, Brew by Numbers. Um, I just think it adds an extra element, I suppose. And people have commented on it as well, mm. saying, um, you know, coffee and walnut mild, mild I wasn't expecting to get. <laughs> or, um, or the Lamington inspired to No one expects the coffee and walnut mild. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so on top of focusing on balance and sessionability, drinkability, you guys do have an Imperial Stout, mm. which came in a cute mini Yeah, 250. Cat, which is the kind of thing that I've been trying to say for all the time. Like I, I have in my collection about 40 Imperial Stouts. I crack about one a year, because once a year I have the opportunity mm-hmm. to share 750 mil with somebody. Mm. Is that why you did it? Or was it concern for drinkers? Or was it just a format you want to drink? It's a, like a, a mixture of all of those things. We, um, I, I do not see the point of releasing a can of really strong beer in a 500 mil even maybe a 440 um no fair enough if you've got a a sharing partner on hand fair enough not everyone does um i think it's a lovely format it looks great um we were inspired by the um go and grab one no you can't if you come with me (laughs) let's start that one again so wherever one goes the other does like a three-legged race in a brewery so we stopped these um amazing um small cans of soft drink um which we sell on the weekends at the tap room um, and I just looked at one of those one day and just said, wouldn't a uh, double wouldn't IPA... Wouldn't be better with Imperial Stout? Either? Yeah, or an Imperial Stout, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, yeah, with our can supplier is able to supply us in anything from 250 mil to a litre, which we'll be trialling this summer as well for right. Breeze. Um, a litre so, yeah. of Breeze? Yeah. yeah. In, the, in the park, a litre of Breeze picnic. And then you're back to like the, sort of the, the table beer kind of notion yeah. where everyone's yeah. just sharing a bottle of it. Absolutely. It's lovely. Yeah. You've got a beer called For The Many which is uh, okay. Jeremy Corbyn's uh, catchphrase. Is that the word for it? I don't know. Is it Corbyn's? It's more Labour than Corbyn, but like, <laughs> that's fine. No, um, that, that seems to be the perception is that it is very much like so many people will come to the tap room on a Saturday and ask for a pint of the Corbyn beer. Obviously, we immediately know what it is. Yeah. But, I mean, it's been a Labour Party slogan for decades, but it's just that Corbyn has really, you know, yeah, put it out there. And yeah, it's... It's weird they call it the Corbyn beer because there's a brewery in North London that have a beer that is literally... is JC 4pm. Amazing. Um, one mile end. Yeah, one mile yeah. end. So why, why did you pick a, a Labour slogan for what is probably your best-selling beer? <laughs> um, uh, sales? Sales. No, um, <laughs> Cynical capitalist. capitalism, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it was... So we both support uh, both members of the Labour Party. Um, just in terms of being a session IPA, it is exactly what it is. It's mm. for it's for the many. It's something that you can have one or two, three, four of, three not four of. And it's the kind of thing I guess that's approachable to anybody exactly. that's yeah. never had it. So it's yeah, sure. it's a it's double meaning. But also we've got the rose on the label. It's you know we're, we're quite unambiguous in our political views. Yeah. Um, because we can't not be like I, I'm a loud opinionated twat when it yeah. comes to that kind of thing um so yeah i, I think we, we felt it was important to have a visual aspect to it um to actually come out and you know to put that slogan on and it's actually led to some incredible discussions in the tap room on saturdays and it's good i mean i guess the dream place to have that kind of discussion is over a beer where everyone's on of one level you sat down and you're yep. having a nice time and trying not to get too serious yeah although beer does get too serious of course uh, but that's more the beer than the politics <laughs> yeah um so finally you guys also run cask the festival um which uh is happening when this year march the 16th belgian influence adjunct brewer with a cask <laughs> festival <laughs> where did that come from so i my first job um back a bit, I, I used to work in beer many many years ago but then i went down the corporate route um but then my first job back in beer was at cask in pimlico mm-hmm. which for me is the best cask pub in london if not yeah. the country um and i managed that for around a year um and so, but I've had a deep-seated love. I, I used um, Smiles Brewery in Bristol. Um, my brother used to run pubs for them. This was 20 years ago. Um, they're sadly now defunct. Um, but I've always had a deep love for cask beer, and I've always had a deep love of what a cask festival could be. Yeah. Uh, and so those things put together, um, yeah. Yeah. So obviously we have GBB. G- Great British beer, yeah, GBBF. GBBF. There's so many acronyms in beer now, (laughs) I can't keep up. Um, Where I think, as much as it has lots of great things about it, one of the main criticisms, which I think is fair, is you've got 600 beers, but they're all of a type. 
So I feel like Cask has a benefit. Like the stuff that's going into Cask for this festival mm -hmm. is unbelievable. Yeah, it's insane. Um, and we've got the breweries to thank for that, their imagination and innovation and willingness to put themselves on the line. Yeah. You know, often um, Pressure Drop never put beer into um, Cask. Their two beers last year were... I mean, Pale Fire is never going to be bad, whatever no. format you put it into. <laughs> but it flew out in about half an hour. It was ridiculous. Yeah. And it was stunning. Um, so, yeah, we owe it all to the breweries. It's, Why it's, is there that great excitement about, you know, Pale Fire, which is zippy and, and like, so that sort of mosaic tang to it, mm. which feels like it should be best fizzy? Why is there an excitement around those kind of beers in cask? Well, I think there's... It depends on how you're serving it as well. And, yeah, uh, just trying things like Jaipur in cask. That's potentially one of the reasons that uh, it inspired me to, <laughs> to have a cask festival. Doing this cask fest, yeah, absolutely, because that on cask, out of the cask, in the cellar, vented in a more, I suppose, or experimenting with vented in a more progressive way, um, as opposed to two days till it's completely flat and put yeah. it on the bar to get as much yield as possible, but actually getting a well-conditioned product that has that zippiness and that light carbonation to it. Um, yeah, I think that's why people are interested because uh, these beers translate beautifully in cask. It's a way of serving a beer. It's yeah. not a style or anything like that. Absolutely. So a festival like this really yeah. shows you can do whatever the hell you want with it mm -hmm. if you do it right. Yeah. And Imperial Stout will work, a Saison will work. Um, what beers are you guys putting into cask for this one? Or have you not announced it yet? Uh, we haven't, but we're making an imperial stout this week which hopefully will go in and actually <laughs> steve and i talked about it last week and because so we've got little earth project we've got blackberry farm coming over from tennessee which oh, is yeah. beyond insane <laughs> yeah. um we've got the most amazing load of experimental brews and we were talking about it last week and we were like I, no one's going to make a best are they right. and there needs to be a best bitter at a cast festival like so that's probably so what we'll do. Yeah. Best in Imperial Style. Yes, I think well, so. Well, I wish you the best. Thank the you. Festival. We'll be yes. there. We'll hopefully get some content while we're there. God, that was cheesy. Um, <laughs> guys, thank you so much for chatting with me. Best of luck with Cask uh, and with your beers. Um, and I'm doing a podcast for Good Beer Hunting, which will be going up in a couple of weeks as well. Um, and I'll put the link in the description box below so you can check that more in-depth chat when it comes out. Thanks, Johnny. Awesome. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Thanks a lot. Thanks.